Okay, buddy. Now we're on to our second bigger thing. Where are we going to see forces and moments? We're going to see them with airfoils. So that is the big thing now, airfoils. Now while with those cylinders, we weren't really talking about moments because they're symmetric, um, circularly symmetric, but um, airfoils are usually not. And so forces and moments are going to both be important here. Okay. Now there is a lot to unpack here. It's probably taking me more than one video to do it. But let's try this out. So first off, here is the shape of an airfoil. I'm trying to draw it bigger because we've got a lot to show. Now inside that airfoil, I have this line that goes from the front point to the back point. And it's a straight line. It's supposed to be straight. And that right there is the cord. I'm going to go ahead and write that as a straight line because I can only do so well at drawing it. So we have our position the vector s going along the surface. We also have some point we can choose as the origin and have y and x going along that. Now the things we have are what's called the angle of attack. That's simply saying I have a free stream velocity of flow going into the front of this airfoil and I am not always parallel to that flow. So in this case I am not and so I have an angle of attack alpha which is the angle between my cord and the free stream velocity. Now due to our pressure distribution and shear stress distribution over the surface I will eventually have a lift, let's put it like right here, a lift and a drag. And these are very, very important details. Now lift and drag are all fine and good, but sometimes what I want instead is to do forces that are perpendicular to my surface or perpendicular to my cord which we call in, that is perpendicular to the cord, and A, which is parallel to the cord. And those two added together lead to our resultant vector R, which is the total force From our pressure distribution and our shear stress, di shear stress distribution. Goodness, I can only talk. Now, why would I want one or the other? Well, it just really honestly depends on the on the situation. So let's figure out how we can go from normal and parallel forces to lift and drag. Okay, normal and parallel forces to lift and drag. So, now that's not honestly all that hard to do. Because if I go back up here, what you'll realize is that the resultant vector, which I did an excellent job of making, um, you know, perfectly um, consistent. Here, I'll, I'll erase this guy and make it a little bit closer to being, there we go, is going to actually give me the same values. Like this, if I'm doing it really well, would be something more like this. There we go. So these guys are supposed to have the same resultant force. And that helps me out because that gives me a better way of going from lift and drag to my, or sorry, from normal and axial components of the force to lift and drag. And so what I get then is that my lift is going to be equal to my normal force times cosine of the angle of attack minus my axial force times sine of the angle of attack. If you look back up here, you see that my normal force is not completely going straight up in the direction that I want to have lift. 
and my axial component is also pointing down compared to my, you know, compared to my um, coordinate system. Now my drag is going to be equal to my normal force times sine of alpha minus or plus my axial force times cosine of alpha. So both of those are going to be leading to it. And this is all just by definition. It would not be hard for you to work that out on your own if you wanted to. But here's the thing. I don't typically do things in terms of normal and axial forces because I'm usually more interested in my pressure distributions. So let's say we're given a pressure distribution here, okay? And we're going to take that and go from there to normal and axial and therefore lift and drag. That is an absolutely horrible looking arrow. Let's see if I can clean it up a little bit. That's better. I like that more. <laughs> okay, how would we do that? How would we take our pressure distributions and shear stress distributions and turn it into normal and axial components? Well, we're going to redraw our airfoil, but this time we're going to draw it with some perspective. Thank goodness for those art classes I've been taking. I have actually been taking art classes. Online, I'm getting there. One day I'm going to learn how to draw everybody. Quit my job and become an art. No, no, not really. I love teaching. Art is for fun. Art is for fun. Okay. So I have some small segment right here on my airfoil. Just as always, that airfoil is in some flow. And we have various values we care about. So first up, we have the chord. Straight line. Straightish line. Do my best here. We have our angle of attack. And what we're also going to have to realize here is that we're going to have an upper surface as well as a lower surface. And so we're going to have what's called SU as well as SL for us going on both sides. We will still have our XY coordinate system, which we'll use every once in a while. And let's see here. That's looking pretty good. Now, you also realize this is not a full wing. So since it's not a full wing, we're saying we're looking at some finite span right here. We're going to call that distance L. I'm not looking at the whole span here, just a portion of it. And then this right here, we're going to call this segment, we're going to give it a distance delta S. Okay, I think we have just about everything. So the last thing we need is the forces. Remember, there's going to be a pressure distribution. And so on this particular surface, we'll have a PS, and we'll also have a shear S that's acting on that surface. They're going to be at some particular angle theta. Good. I think I have everything. It's looking pretty good there. Okay. So... Now what we're doing is we're looking at that shaded segment and we can figure out what the forces are going to be on that shaded segment. Because remember, pressure is just equal to force over area. So let's do that. So if pressure is equal to force over area, and that means that force is equal to pressure times area. And in this case, area is going to be equal to my delta S times the span. So let's figure out what our forces are going to be in this case. So for the y component, we have delta n for the upper section, because this is this upper side we're looking at right now, is going to be equal to negative p upper, because we're pushing down, times my area, 
delta SU, I'm just going to call this U because it's upper, times the length, cosine of theta, minus my shear stress on the upper surface. Remember, it can be different for both surfaces, times delta SL sine of theta. So this right here is simply the area, okay? That is the area of our segment. The other ones, though, are very, very similar to our original equations. You see the cosine theta, and you see the sine, or sorry, cosine of an angle, and you see the sine of an angle. Then if we're going to do our axial component for this upper surface, be very similar. We're going to have SU times our length sine of theta plus the steer stress on the upper surface times delta S. Once again, this will be upper surface times the length cosine of theta. Okay. Now, It's convenient because, you know, I don't know what my span is here, but a lot of times what we do is we do things per unit span. And so we're going to go ahead and do that right now. We're going to simplify this and make this per unit span. So we just have a smaller segment of our wing. We're just saying, ah, oh, we're looking at each segment by itself. And so when I do that, what I do is I have take my axial component or my normal component, I divide by the length, and then we use a little prime here. So the, the prime is simply saying that it's now per unit span. And just remember, the prime means per unit span. There we go. So if we do that, our equations get a little bit simpler, not crazy simpler, but a little bit simpler, and they'll look like the following. Let's see, I was using that before, but these are more or less our final, oh, not quite final directions. Let's leave black here. So what that gives me then is I have delta in upper prime is equal to, in parentheses, my pressure on the upper surface, cosine of theta, minus my shear stress on the upper surface, sine of theta, times my segment size. And I get the same for my axial component. Once again, the prime is saying this is per unit length. So these are my forces per unit span. Of my little segment that I had shaded in. Now, the body force is going to be the sum of all of these segments. And that's going to be the upper and lower there. So you can't forget that there's two sides here. So what we do then is we're going to integrate along that surface. Now, I'm not going to have a closed form solution because we don't have one particular airfoil here. Um, but this is how you would get the overall equations. So we would integrate along the surface. We're going to have to do that for both sides. Ooh, sorry, terrible handwriting. Looked at my notes and I started writing as I normally do integrate along our surface. And so we get two big equations here. And that would be n prime is going to be equal to, eh, I'll leave this in red because this is a pretty big equation here. 
n prime is equal to an integral from the leading edge to the trailing edge of negative times p u cosine of theta plus tau u sine of theta dSU plus yes there's two components to this because I have to do both the um, the bottom and the top surface so u is for upper l is for lower There we go. So, just a reminder, TE stands for trailing edge. LE for leading edge. This is for upper surface. And this one right here is for the lower surface. Upper surface and lower surface. Then continuing on we can get our axial force per unit fan and we have to once again integrate for the leading edge to the trailing edge of negative PU sine of theta plus tau u cosine of theta. It's looking pretty good so far. And then we have the bottom surface too. Now if you're wondering, are we going to be using these equations all the time, doing lots of integrals? Not really. I mean, you will do integrals, but it's not nearly as important. I'm more or less just showing you the theory of how we get from normal and axial forces to our lift and drag, because it's important to know where these things come from and how we can go from pressure distributions to things we actually care about if you were measuring them. There we go. Okay, stop there for now and next time we'll talk about some of the moments we're feeling and see. See you in a bit.